When the Daily Wire first announced it was getting into film production, they were clear about wanting to make movies that could be enjoyed by everyone, not simply conservative message movies that no one really enjoys. They wanted their values to underpin each movie, but not hit you over the head with them the way woke Hollywood supposedly does. They wanted their movies to be good. You're not going to be hit over the head with either right-wing or left-wing causes the way that TV usually does. At the time, a lot of naysayers assumed we'd see them produce adaptations of Ben Shapiro's poorly received novel or have Andrew Clavin write all their screenplays. But The Daily Wire insisted it wanted to act like a genuine studio with movies for a wide audience and not just an outlet for their vanity projects. When they announced their project, they quite sensibly sought out genuine filmmakers. They began working with Cinestate, recently renamed Bonfire Legend, who had previously produced some low-budget hits. Bonfire Legend's track record of making a small profit with a limited budget made them a great partner for a burgeoning production company. The head of Bonfire Legend, Dallas Saunier, spoke quite openly about his beliefs that movies shouldn't try to fit some kind of political agenda. Although a conservative himself, back when he aligned his company with The Daily Wire, he claimed he wasn't interested in making a movie for political purposes. I never would make a movie for political purposes. I feel like uh, movies have been political for, for, for generations, but I feel like when things get overtly political or agenda pushing, um, I tend to believe that it hurts the artwork. Sonia currently serves as a producer on pretty much every movie or TV project The Daily Wire puts out, including the one I'll be talking about later on. The partnership brought with it a movie that had been sitting on the shelf for several months as no major studio was interested in distributing it. That movie was Run, Hide, Fight, which is basically Die Hard set in a school shooting, and it would become the first movie distributed under the Daily Wire logo. Also as a quick aside, Run, Hide, Fight was made with a producer who was, at the time, charged with sexually assaulting a minor, and they also killed a deer on screen, but those are stories for another video that I luckily already made. This first movie was supposed to set the tone for the Daily Wire productions. Original, daring, and a genuine attempt to reach a mainstream audience. They didn't have the budget of the big studios, but they wanted to be taken seriously by giving people quality products. We're working to make the kind of entertainment that you want, the kind of entertainment that you can enjoy, that speaks to you without speaking down to you. No leftist sucker punches in the kind of content that we're making. Entertainment that you can not only enjoy, but be proud of knowing that you helped change the culture. The next few movies they released followed Run, Hide, Fight's pattern of an appeal outside of The Daily Wire's usual conservative bubble. There was Shut In, a mediocre thriller that included the comeback of noted anti-Semite and sex weirdo Vincent Gallo, The Hyperions, a kind of low-rent Wes Anderson-type superhero movie, one that had been completed several years ago but was then distributed by The Daily Wire. And then we got former Star Wars Mandalorian star Gina Carano's Terror on the Prairie, a dull western that was meant to be Carano's big comeback, though so far that hasn't quite panned out. And then everything went quiet for a while. They released those three movies in the first half of 2022, and The Daily Wire, perhaps noticing the lack of enthusiasm these movies were generating, seemed like they were trying to retool. They did announce some plans in early 2023, like an adaptation of Atlas Shrugged and a drama series based on the Pendragon cycle of books, but those were scheduled to be released in 2024. They did launch a kid streaming service called BentKey in October of 2023, though that was from a separate stream of funding exclusively reserved for kids' content. They did announce a new movie, Snow White, also for 2024, but also for kids. Without any launches between mid-2022 and seemingly all of 2023, it did raise the question of what was going on with this entertainment for adult audiences that they were supposedly developing. At first, I had mistakenly assumed they had decided to sit out 2023 entirely, focusing on making the Atlas Shrugged and Pendragon projects the best they could be in the new year. But then, on November 27th of 2023, we were treated to the surprise announcement of the movie Lady Ballers, and it would be coming out a mere four days later on December 1st. Lady Ballers is a comedy that seemed like the company completely backtracking on its attempt to make something mainstream. This was a conservative movie for a conservative audience. Not just a generally conservative audience, one very particularly tuned to the messages regularly sent out by The Daily Wire. There were no more professional actors, directors, or writers. This would be the conservative commentary gang coming together to make a movie of their very own. And all the predictions every snarky left-wing commentator made had come true. The Daily Wire wasn't interested in financing talented people to make movies for them. They were showbiz failures who desperately wanted to make movies of their own. And now they have Lady Ballers to prove they can make something every bit as terrible as Hollywood. Or worse. And let's be real here, way worse. 
If we're looking to blame someone for Lady Baller's existing, we have to start with Barack Obama, at least according to Jeremy Boring. There has not been a true comedy made since Barack Obama became president. I mean, Barack Obama destroyed three things, rock and roll, comedy, and America. <laughs> that was the so I guess this is another thing we have to thank Obama for. I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but Boring did miss the part where Obama also destroyed anime. Before Obama, we had like Fist of the North Star and Dragon Ball Z and you know uh, all of these like shonen boys anime. And then after everyone is like going into video games and trying to bang their sister. And that's just like, you know, what Obama did to the genre. If Obama destroyed comedy, it was Joe Rogan that planted the seed that perhaps the Daily Wire should do something about it. You don't see a lot of f***ing really hardcore comedy movies anymore. Do you know what would have to happen? You would have to do one on like a right-wing streaming platform like the <laughs> Daily Wire. But it really struck me. And I thought, this this is kind of a, a challenge and a responsibility. If it is true that only the Daily Wire could do this, then it stands to reason that the Daily Wire must do it. Lady Ballers came together very quickly as a project. It was conceived in March of 2023 and produced in roughly five months. And it certainly shows. Here's a quick rundown of the plot. Rob Gibson used to be a successful high school basketball coach, but that was many years ago and his life has gotten off track. A convoluted scheme is hatched to use his former high school championship team posing as trans women to earn a spot in the global games. They can't say Olympics because of some rights issues. This plan is foiled by another team of fake trans women and Rob learns it's better to win when it's not at the expense of others. While that may sound pretty straightforward, the script for this movie is a total mess. One thing I glossed over in my summary is how convoluted this premise is. You might imagine that the Rob character is a scumbag who hatches a scheme. After all, he's the coach who runs the team and it was his quest to become a winner again that motivated the whole scam. The very concept of the global games and wanting to qualify for it is seen through his eyes in one of the early scenes in the movie. The global games. When I was a kid, you had to be an elite athlete just to try out for the games. Now they'll let any loser try. Rob later runs into Alex, one of his former players, and tries to legitimately coach to perform in a marathon. Alex, who had been working in drag at a diner, shows up wearing their wig. So the person registering people for the race thinks that Alex is trans, which seems like it would be enough to spark the idea, but Rob only puts two and two together when an evil journalist named Gwen arrives to prod him along. And it's only then that the premise of the movie finally begins to take shape, and they decide to put together that team. But even then, we get several lengthy scenes where each member of the team is recruited. The Lady Ballers don't hit the court until nearly one hour into the movie. If that sounds like a long slog to get to the point, it certainly felt like it. At no point did anyone seem to ask the obvious question, can anything be cut from this script? The runtime for this movie was a sprawling one hour and 50 minutes. Most comedies tend to be much shorter so they don't drag things out, but this movie seemed to cut absolutely nothing from its first draft, and if anything just seemed to add on top of all of it. And the result is a confused structure where some plot elements are introduced, picked up, and dropped at random. For example, let's look at the character David. When we first meet him, we find him living in the woods as a survivalist. He was traumatized by a badger mascot, and now he has some form of PTSD. What was that badger hopper? And to demonstrate the full extent of his damaged psyche, we find out he's got a guy locked up in his basement. Please let me go. Shut your mouth, you pervert badger! A few minutes later, in another scene, we see David attack Blaine when he dresses up like a mascot. Badger! This is all setting up some kind of character arc for David, right? Learning to overcome his PTSD and learning that mascots or badgers aren't so scary after all. Well, you would think that, but the mascot trauma is never mentioned again, and the mascot guy trapped in the shack died, I guess, because he's never seen or mentioned ever again. In a later scene, we get a brief moment where David starts a different subplot, feeling guilty about being a cis man pretending to be a trans woman. But a few minutes later, he's fine, and this moment is forgotten. Holy crap, they are gonna be this easy! While the movie is resolved in part for the pity felt towards cis women, none of that is really centered around David. He's a character just kind of adrift in the plot, seeming to have his own little stories at some point only to have them being dropped and forgotten. This is just one example of how poorly constructed the script for this movie is. The script for Lady Ballers is credited to Jeremy Boring, Brian A. Hoffman, and Nick Sheehan. Originally, Boring outlined the script and asked Hoffman and Sheehan to write it in two weeks. They put together a, a script in that, in that time. They solved some plot elements that were really good. Um, 
But sort of like everyone that we approached with this idea originally, no one wants to go all the way. And so I did a little work on the script to help make sure that it went went the full distance. So ultimately, I think the blame here lies with Boring for a script that's a complete mess. More than the mess on the page, Boring is also responsible for the mess on the screen as well. Not only does he play the main character, Rob Gibson, he's also the movie's director. And let's talk about some of this acting. The performances in this movie are rough, dog rough. I know you're not a woman. Hey, you don't know how he identifies. Save it. I'm a journalist. I literally cannot be shamed. Maybe this is your shot at redemption. I have been redeemed through badger blood. When's the last time you felt like someone? I mean, I kind of always feel like someone. When was the last time you got laid? We're in. It won't surprise anyone that many of these people are not actors. The majority of this cast is made up of conservative talking heads many of whom should never be allowed anywhere near a camera, whether they're acting or not. Three of the main characters are made up of the crew from Crane and Company. If you're not familiar with that program, I wouldn't be surprised because no one watches their YouTube channel. It's a sports commentary channel run by the Daily Wire, with a panel consisting of Jake Crane, Blaine Crane, and David Cohn. They all go by their own names in this movie. Apparently, they were former athletes and coaches, though David Cohn should not be confused with the former baseball pitcher of the same name who helped win the 1992 World Series with the Toronto Blue Jays. Daniel Considine plays Alex. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure who this guy is, aside from being an actor who accepted this role. His IMDb page only has a few credits, mostly shorts, and he also has a few producer credits as well. He'll also be in the Daily Wire's Pendragon cycle as Magnus Maximus so we've got that to look forward to. His performance is different in that it's okay. He's not great, but might seem better considering all the people around him. Or maybe they're dragging him all down as he has no one to play off of him. It's hard to say. Tyler Fisher, who plays Felix, is a very odd fit in this movie since he appears to actually have some genuine acting talent. After I sold my company, I thought, I'm gonna build the sickest gym for when my bros come hey! over, huh? But this is the first time we've ever come over here. So it was totally worth it. Fisher is a comedian who has appeared in several small roles over the years. Anybody have uh, Netflix in here? Yes. Can I, uh, can I have your password? But eventually he was supposedly fired by his agency for being white. I was fired from an acting agent for being white. What? They told me in an email. Yeah. Right? It's a big agency. This stuff's been happening for so long. Last I checked, white men are still getting roles in movies and TV shows, though. According to his IMDb page, Fisher also has a credit of playing the role of Penis on Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. I'm only pointing that out because it made me laugh. Billy Ray Brandt is another face you're probably not familiar with. She's got a pretty big TikTok following with around 500,000 followers. It was producer Dallas Sonnier who found her, and this role seems to be up in her profile. But at what cost? <laughs> I don't know if he wrote that scene specifically, but Jeremy definitely didn't cut it when he went over the script. And whatever horrible things Billy Ray Brandt has said, I don't think she should have to lick Jeremy Boren's face. If you were curious about the age gap here, at the time of filming, Brandt was 25 and Boren was 44. Lexi Contursi played Darby, Rob's ex-wife. She had some high-profile jobs in her past, probably most notably being on the series Laguna Beach. She's not been as prominently featured since, but I don't imagine she'll be putting this one near the top of her resume. Rosie Seraphine Harper plays their daughter Winnie. This is her first role, and I have nothing to say about this child. The last member of the main cast will probably be the most familiar. It's Matt Walsh playing Chris, Darby's new left-wing boyfriend. I have to give credit to the man for getting another paycheck to do something he has absolutely no talent for. While the bad wig seems like sloppy wardrobe, it's actually a very clumsy foreshadowing for the big reveal at the end of the movie. I don't understand how anything you did helped to make this situation better. Don't you? The joke here is that this doesn't actually make sense and is just an excuse to wink to the Daily Wire audience. Also, I really need to mention that this joke was ripped off from one of the most famous episodes of The Simpsons ever, Marge vs. the Monorail. My work is done here. Your work is done. You didn't do anything. <laughs> didn't I? Although I will acknowledge it was genuinely funny watching Matt Walsh fake laugh. It's almost as though he's never heard someone laugh before. <laughs> 
And yes, that is Candace Owens sitting next to him. She does appear in the movie, but this is just a cameo. And these cameos are for the only audience that will ever care about this movie, the Daily Wire fans. We have cameos by Andrew Clavin, Brett Cooper, Michael Knowles, and of course, Ben Shapiro. Shapiro probably deserves some kind of special award for being especially bad at acting in this. Technical, and you shut the f*** up, transphobic mother Oh. There's also a cameo by Jordan Peterson during the ending credits. The saddest cameo is the humorless Ted Cruz one. It's a complete drag, and perhaps even more pathetic is that Ted Cruz in that moment was living his dream. Ted has been itching for this all his life since he was doing high school yeah, drama right. and then somehow ended up in the United States Senate and also running for president. Yeah. What he actually wanted. Of course. This is, if he had gotten this when he was 20, he never would have been in politics. This wasn't Boring's first attempt to get Ted Cruz into a project either. Apparently, he approached Cruz for a role in the Pendragon cycle, but Cruz couldn't do it because he supposedly has a job in the Senate. Although it tells you a lot about the upcoming drama series if they were trying to get Ted Cruz a role in it. Looking at this movie's cast, one of the most ironic lines in Lady Ballers is certainly this one. What does any kid who can choose anything in the world do? Mm, actor. Actor. That line also has a meta element to it as well, because according to Jeremy Boring, no real actors wanted to be in this thing. And literally every single actor that we went out to for every single role told us no. At no point does Jeremy Boring seem to consider that the idea for this movie is terrible. Rather, he thinks these nameless actors are afraid of this particular sacred cow. It's a convenient way of avoiding his awful taste in comedy. As an example, Warren seems to think that certain jokes are timelessly funny. Here's one example he gives us. For all of human history, dudes dressing like chicks is funny. Because it's incongruous and <laughs> silly. Thank you. Back in 16th century England, plays were performed exclusively by men, most notably those of Shakespeare. You might have guessed this wasn't done for a laugh, and many of these plays were not comedies. And of course, there are many modern examples of cross-dressing that aren't meant to be funny. But the point here is that Boring doesn't really mean all of human history when he says men dressing as women is funny. He means he personally has always thought it was funny, and he can't step outside of his own limited experience and understanding of comedy. More than just its bad concept and cameos, this movie is so transparently red meat for the Daily Wire's conservative audience. There are complaints about Disney being woke. I hear Disney's gonna make the new Snow White a neurodivergent lesbian. Neurodivergent black lesbian. There are jokes about Bud Light. Bud Light, I'm sponsored now. Oh buddy, they'll give that shit to any dude in the press. And of course, there are Dylan Mulvaney references. Being a girl athlete, I've already eaten a whole pint of pistachio ice cream. But these small signifiers aside, there are also references only Daily Wire fans would get, like this one. You're a god among men, coach. I am, Talboy. I really am. This is a reference to Jeremy Boring calling himself a god king. There are also ads in the movie for Jeremy's various white label scam products. These Jeremy's razors are amazing. And did you know that Jeremy's now offers a razor specially designed for women? These are jokes that could only be understood by a Daily Wire audience. Otherwise, why would a movie stop to feature a razor ad? The Daily Wire knows who this movie is for. It's the same group of conservatives they sell all their products to. After the movie's release, Boring touted that this movie had been the best launch day for new subscribers, which is a very convoluted metric that would be so much easier to understand if he just told us how many new people signed up. And the launch day qualifier is particularly important. No one even knew this movie existed a week before its premiere, whereas others had months of promotion. Naturally, any interest in the platform is going to convert to a subscription close to or on its launch. And without being told how many new subscribers they got, how it compares to other launches, and ideally, how many total subscribers they have now, this tells us very little. The Daily Wire hasn't announced any of their subscriber numbers in over a year. They used to tout their totals constantly when they were growing, but it's possible they stagnated or even dropped off. If they had around 1 million subscribers last year, in November, and a lot of people cancelled or let their subscriptions lapse. Signing those same people back up to get them back to 1 million subscribers, for instance, is not that impressive a feat. If anything, this movie could easily be explained as a production that was rushed out the door in an effort to appeal to that audience they lost when they failed to produce any kind of entertainment product for over a year. Congrats on the Rotten Tomato score, I guess, and the off-the-chart buzz, whatever that means. So we know who this movie is speaking to, but what is it actually trying to say? 
The obvious and most direct message is that trans identities are invalid. The script is heavy-handed in how it highlights this message and doesn't discuss it in an interesting way. It frames anyone who affirms trans identities as childish, in the form of a literal child teaching everyone about it. You'll need a crap ton of drugs or complicated surgery every seven or eight months if your body is big. The movie also trots out tired cliches comparing being transgender to trans age. These aren't the jokes of a movie taking the other side seriously. And as a comedy, I guess it doesn't have to. But it does make an attempt to be more serious by including one trans character in the movie, Alex. By the time I get to the end of this little summary of Alex's journey, it's going to be quite apparent that their gender is a bit murky, so I'm just going to be using they, them pronouns. And if you're sort of the person who gets upset by the use of pronouns, I suggest you leave a long, angry comment. And I might notice, but I definitely won't read it. When we first met Alex as an adult, they are wearing a woman's wig, which we assume is part of their job working at the drag diner. But we start getting more subtle hints as the movie goes along that Alex's gender might not be what they were assigned at birth. Alex, is that a purse? It's a purse. Although Alex's perspective of womanhood is not the most enlightened, it is in line with how this movie sees women. Just shave your legs. Tell each other how brave you are for things that require absolutely no physical courage. And don't be afraid to cry at work. And by taking on feminine traits, Alex starts to realize more things about themselves. This is the best experience of my life, coach. I feel like a brand new woman. Brand new man? What? This is where the movie is on the cusp of being interesting. Alex is meant to be a sympathetic character, especially in contrast to obvious foils such as Gwen. But if the movie affirmed Alex's identity, it would have to betray its entire premise. In the context of this movie, Alex went from being miserable working at a diner to playing with their friends and doing what they love the most. While the other lady ballers were definitely lying, Alex wasn't. At least not entirely. I am a woman. I mean, this is who I am. I'm proud of myself for the first time. At this moment, it seems like Alex has had a journey of self-discovery, realizing that they are trans and that their gender is not as simple as what they were told it was when they were a child. But then the movie confronts this reality with a very bad response. You gotta believe me when I tell you this. You are not a woman. We've all gone along with this lie instead of just hurting your feelings and telling you the truth. There's very little real sympathy for Alex in this scene. This is just an authority figure telling them who they are and promising to get them help, which turns out to be a counseling session with Jordan Peterson. What Rob offers is a supposed reality check that's literally a punch to the balls. How can you be so sure I'm not a woman? At no point is Alex's well-being taken into consideration here. We see Rob simply assume authority. He knows next to nothing about trans issues or identities, and we don't get any evidence that he knows anything really about Alex's personal life. Instead of genuinely trying to explore this topic, he's there to correct Alex into thinking the way Rob thinks. Ironically, the movie does highlight how many aspects of gender are performative, but it ultimately still falls on genitals determining gender, ignoring any modern understanding of gender to give the audience the easy answer they want. The movie still can't get out of its way with this line from Alex, though. This comes near the end of the movie when the group starts a youth sports center. Kids will have a chance to figure out who they really are. I'm the best coach anyone could help for. What does Alex mean, figure out who they really are? If Coach Rob is in charge, they'll be told who they are based on their genitals. Kids having the space to figure out their gender sounds like a good thing, but there was no figuring out of anything in this movie. Alex tried to figure something out on their own, but when they expressed themselves to Rob, he pressured him to immediately going back towards the gender they were assigned at birth through the genital test. And I... Certainly hope that isn't the test Rob is using with kids at this youth center. There's another character who claims to be trans, and it reveals another element of this movie's theme. We see it in this moment between Rob and his daughter Winnie. I want to be a boy. What? I want to be a winner just like you, Daddy. What's that have to do with being a boy? Boys are better at everything. Winnie's admission here seems less genuine than Alex. Alex spoke to an inner feeling of self, whereas Winnie sees boyhood as a path to victory. There's probably a version of this script where gender as a path towards fulfillment is examined, either through the supposed benefits that gender entails, or because of the inner sense of self. 
distinguishing between the two to reveal that one pursuit is more fulfilling than the other. A line like this even hints at that better script. Most of the stem feels rock and roll opening pickle jars? Okay. Yeah, boys are better at all of those things. But those are just things, Winnie. Things boys made up so we'd have something to be good at. But it doesn't stick the landing when, instead of examining the arbitrary nature of gender social constructs, it falls back to a very boring gender essentialism. They're better at communicating and building community. And they civilize men. Plus, mommy brought you into the world. That's a superpower no man will ever have. Women civilize men and make babies. A life in service of others, apparently. And it also helps us transition to one of the movie's other major points. Near the end of the movie, the lady ballers realize posing as women is wrong and they offer their spots in the second half of their final game to a team of little girls. Although I'm sure this was meant to be a statement about preserving a space for little girls to play sports, the symbolism here is deeply messed up. It visually frames women's sports as a patronizing game that men allow women to play, humoring their efforts rather than respecting them. For a movie that's a rebuke of trans women competing alongside cis women in sports, it doesn't seem to have much or any kind of respect for women's sports. It's ladies basketball, boys. Nobody watches. This is great! It's like watching men's basketball! And not just basketball, the movie goes out of its way to show men dominating women in a number of different sports, often depicting violence towards those women, and in one case violence towards a little girl. It wasn't just stunt performers though. Women come off terribly in this movie. As the movie reaches its close, Coach Rob sums up his journey while many of the familiar faces he met throughout the story reappear. It really hammers home how many female antagonists were in this movie. Lady Ballers is less concerned with standing up for women's sports, or women in general, than it is with trying to undermine trans identities. When it includes scenes of cis women upset that they lost to trans women, it's hard to take it seriously when these athletes are presented as so unimpressive that no one would ever want to actually see them play, unless they were being crushed by men. This movie doesn't care about women at all. There are means to an end, and that end is hating on trans people. There's a really good summary of this in a video by The Humanist Report, and I suggest everyone check that out to see how it manifests itself in the real world. Going back to Lady Ballers, there's also this boring, casual racism in the movie. Like the team of fake trans women who the Lady Ballers are defeated by are all black. And there's, of course, a joke about one of them having a large penis. Racism isn't really the main focus of the movie, it just kind of hums along in the background, showing up every now and again through a really tired joke, likely a callback to the days of comedy when these sorts of jokes were commonplace, apparently not knowing that audiences' tastes have evolved since then, and people are more aware why jokes like this are bad. This is reflective of the movie's failings in general, and probably reflective of how they believe Obama ruined comedy. Jeremy Boring seems to think that people's fear of being called out by the left is why people don't laugh at racially themed jokes anymore. But it could just be that people are less fond of jokes that hurt marginalized communities. That Jeremy doesn't understand this, or simply doesn't believe it to be true, says more about his attitude towards hateful humor than any modern understanding of the comedy landscape. Of course, if this movie becomes a big breakout hit, I'll eat my words on that one. But so far, it's only reverberating loudly in the usual right-wing echo chamber. Part of the marketing for this movie is that this is the sort of comedy that woke Hollywood is afraid to make. A lot of people were quick to point out similar movies where a man dresses in drag to play in women's sports, such as Ladybugs and She's the Man. The most common comparison, though, was the 2002 movie Joanna Man, starring Miguel A. Nunez Jr. This movie was not well-received critically and only made just under $14 million at the box office. Jeremy Boring has said he never heard of Joanna Man before making Lady Ballers. So it of turns course. out that there was a movie 20 years ago called Joanna Man, right. which I learned about yesterday. Personally, I can believe that an old white guy is unfamiliar with a lesser-known early 2000s comedy featuring a largely black cast. But the real question is, how does it compare to Lady Ballers? And while Joanna Man isn't a good movie, at the very least it expresses some respect for women's basketball by not treating the sport as if it would be instantly dominated by any man who enters it. The movie is actually about learning to respect women, the value of teamwork, and understanding the toxic masculinity that exists within oneself. I'm not saying it did a good job with any of that messaging. The plot is ludicrous, the jokes were rough even in 2002, and it's a dull watch. But it does at least make an attempt at respecting women. Because you guys never needed me to win this. And you don't need me now. I needed you. Jamal, that's the main character in Juana Man, 
demonstrates real character growth throughout the movie, and the women on the Banshees, the team he joins, show they're capable of performing at a high level even without having a man on their team. In Lady Ballers, the big heartfelt speeches are Rob telling other people how they should be. He grows very little throughout the movie and immediately pivots to telling his daughter and Alex how they should live their lives. He's even given an out as his worst actions were framed as a manipulation of Gwen. Rob is a textbook example of a mediocre man doing the bare minimum to be better and then being rewarded for it. To be honest, it's a lot what it feels like to be a cisgender man sometimes. So maybe that movie is more realistic than I first gave it credit for. Although obviously existing in a comedy world, Lady Ballers is meant to depict a real-world issue, something that was mentioned by Ben Shapiro in this clip that was spread around social media. I think I'd actually suggest to the Crane Boys that they do this as a doc. Yes. I, I originally went to them and I said, you guys should like go try out for a bunch of ladies' leagues, and that became not possible because, as it turns out, most ladies' leagues don't allow in actual Brutes. men. Men, and uh, they weren't willing to go the full distance <laughs> in terms of what it would require in order to, you know, the actual hormone treatments and everything to play in some of the ladies' leagues. People noted that Ben used the term actual men here as a lack of honesty when he denies trans identities. It could simply be a simple slip of the tongue. I'm not sure it matters, as regardless of what he secretly believes or not, Shapiro is still broadcasting anti-trans content, and that's far more important than any kind of hypocrisy. Personally, I'm far more interested in the fact that the very premise of the movie, of men pretending to be trans to play in women's leagues, which the folks at the Daily Wire keep insisting is a real thing, couldn't be replicated by the Daily Wire because it turns out it's more involved than simply throwing on a wig. Yet in that same interview, they still insist that this is a real problem in the world. It's hilarious because that's absurd and that should never be allowed under any circumstances. And that is actually happening in the actual world. If that hypothesis were true, the documentary idea Ben Shapiro had should have been very easy to pull off. Except they couldn't, because it isn't that simple. This should be a moment of reflection, but instead they just insist that this movie is reflecting what's happening in the real world. That trans women are faking it so they can win in sports, regardless of the evidence to the contrary. It's a staggering display of the persistence of ideology in the face of a real-world experience. During the production of this movie, there was a protest from extras who were hired to take part in it unaware of what the production was all about. They began demonstrating once they learned who it was, and it became a small story around Nashville. Before wrapping up here, I wanted to give a quick update on a new one that was recently announced, and that's The Daily Wire's first animated series for adults. It's called Mr. Burcham, starring Adam Carolla, based on the character of the same name from Crank Anchors and KROQ Radio that was created and voiced by Carolla. This Mr. Burcham was inspired by Carolla's high school woodshop teacher. The cast is made up of a strange mix of vocal talents, including Megan Kelly, Roseanne Barr, Candace Owens, Patrick Warburton, and to my dismay, Danny Trejo. I know he's not picky about his roles, but this seems especially bad. Also, Brett Cooper is in this too, because she is, I guess, going to be in every single creative project The Daily Wire makes. Here's a brief taste of the show. You ever see a vegan wolf on the Nature Channel? I'm a vegan. <laughs> That definitely looks like something. It's been a busy couple of weeks for The Daily Wire's entertainment ambitions. With the release of Lady Ballers and the announcement of Mr. Burcham, it seems like they're leaning more deeply into their own right-wing commentary space, seeming to let go of their mainstream ambitions and acknowledging the reality that they are only speaking to a small conservative audience. According to Boring, Lady Ballers cost $7 million to make. That's probably a reasonable scale for a small project for a small audience. And really, that's the most The Daily Wire can probably hope to achieve. Perhaps they expect more from future projects, though we'll have a better idea once it's closer to the release of those things. And if they were hoping these other projects might hit the mainstream, I think they're missing out on what their audience wants, and that's more stuff like Lady Ballers. A cheesy, poorly produced mess that speaks directly to specific conservative issues featuring all the conservative commentators that they've grown to love. I don't think they'll be able to escape their own audience unless they can make something that isn't complete garbage. When I started working on this review, the original plan was to watch a bunch of gender swap sports movies and compare them to Lady Ballers. But as I got started, I realized I had quite a bit to say about Lady Ballers as a piece of film. And so I didn't spend too much time talking about other movies of a similar ilk. Although I did get to watch Joanna Man for the first time, and um, that was an experience. If you were wondering, is this thing funny enough to watch ironically, I would say no. It's very long and slow and boring. Did I mention it was an hour and 50 minutes? 
It felt longer than that. So avoid it at all costs. And for goodness sake, try not to give any money to the Daily Wire, even if you want to have a laugh at their terrible productions. Although if you've been saying to yourself, I feel like I should give money to someone who produces video content, then I suggest you join my Patreon or become a member to the channel, like the fine names you see scrolling up on the screen now. If you join at the $5 tier, you'll get early access to videos, your name in the credits, and other fun bonuses I throw in along the way. If you would like to support this channel in a non-monetary fashion, though, you can like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and maybe share it somewhere on social media. Thank you all so much for watching.